I was, uh, I was asked to encourage everybody to scooch over just a little bit and get friendly with people. And also that there is overflow available across the street in the chapel uh, if the space is necessary. For those of you who are standing in the back, there is still some seating available here in the front and here on the wing uh, to my side. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you here for an occasion I wish I didn't have to welcome you for. We're here to grieve tonight the loss of Tom Heslop, but we are also here to celebrate his life, not just his life in this world, but the promise of eternal life that we hope, and I'm sure he would hope if he were here, to say that we can spend together. So I'm glad you could be here for this service this evening, thank you. Good evening, my name's Ernie. I uh, joined this Heslop family or clan when my daughter Cassie married Darren. And it's a privilege for me to uh, ask you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord's blessing on our gathering this evening. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you for your watch, care, and your love. Tonight, most of all, we thank you for your son, Tom, for the life that he's lived, for the light that he has shined upon us, for the way he has shown us your character, Lord. Pray in a special way that you'll be with Seedy, be with Darren, Gavin, and Trevor. We pray that you'll be with Lauren, and Cassie, and Carly. May our time here together, Lord, help bind them together, help them to understand how much you love them. May we also, Lord, understand where this wonderful man came from. May we understand what shaped his life. May we understand how it made him the man that he was. Father, may each one of us be reflective of that love, and we thank you for Tom's life and his service. Please be with us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, everyone. Uh, the scripture reading I'll be doing today is from 2 Timothy 4, and it will be verses 7 and 8. Once again, that is 2 Timothy 4 
verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. On Monday, March 29 of 1984, Thomas Robert Heslop was born to Thomas Henry Harry Heslop and Martha Jean Clack Heslop in Brackpan, South Africa. He was the baby of the family with two brothers, Ronnie and George, and a sister, Jean. He, loving, lovingly refer, he was lovingly referred to in the family as Lot Lamaki, which means late lamb, because he was born eight years after his sister, Jean. His mother died the day before his fourth birthday, and so he was sent to live with his mother's sister's family as his father could not take care of him because he had to work. He would see his father maybe twice a year. When he was 11, his dad became an Adventist and married Mary Tolyart Erasmus, an Adventist widow who Tom lovingly called Auntie Mary, or Mom. He and Auntie Mary quickly formed a tight bond, and he chose to move, to, to move in with her and his father at Suri Court, and that is where every morning his father would wake him up with a hot cup of tea before leaving on the train for work, which might explain my dad's obsession with tea. <laughs> Tom's nephew, Tommy Hendricks, or Clayne Tommy, young Tommy, came and lived with them for a few years during my dad's time at Selborne High School, and they formed a very tight relationship, which was cherished by both of them to this day. Also integral in his life, it, at this stage was Uncle Yanni and Auntie Odette, his stepmother's youngest sister and her husband. They had no children of their own and treated him as their own son. Uncle Yanni was the dad that, who had the energy to play with him, teach him different sports, and taught him to love soccer and tennis. Tom's father passed away of a heart attack when he was 15. Out of love for him, his siblings and stepmom decided to save his father's insurance money so that Tom could go to college, the first and only of his family to do so. He went to Heldeberg College near Cape Town in South Africa and earned an undergraduate degree in English at the end of 1975. During college, Tom lost several loved ones, one being his best friend David Sparrow and his other, his dear stepmom, who passed away his senior year. After his stepmother passed away, Uncle Yanni and Auntie Odette became his family. After college, Tom worked for six months with Uncle Yanni in the factory, then went into the Army from July of 1976 until July of 77. At the end of that year, while at a outing with friends, the education director of the South African Union pulled him out and said, we've been searching for you. We want to know if you'll go to Bethel College and teach English. So he packed up his new Ford Cortina, which he had purchased with his Army release money and nicknamed Big, Big Bad Orange, and drove through the trans sky to Bethel College. During the trip, he rounded a corner and ran into a flock of sheep, messing up the front of his new car. <laughs> it was a very eventful way to start a new job. It was well worth it, though, because it was at Bethel that Tom's relationship with his future wife, Seedy, began to blossom. They had met before when he was at Heldeberg back in 1974 when Seedy was attending the high school there. But if you told anybody on campus that they would have married one day, they would have laughed in your face. Seedy's father, Milton Seatman, was a principal at Bethel College when my dad got there. And Seedy was at home after her first year of college, teaching math and science on a temporary basis until the regular teacher arrived. As the relationship grew, they would visit a faculty member who was sick in the hospital every day, which was a good excuse to spend some time together. On March 2nd of 1978, they drove to the town of East London, and at Granny Ainsley's apartment, Tom asked Seedy to be his girlfriend. And every year since then, on March 2nd, Tom would wish Seedy a happy anniversary. Tom became part of the Seatman family almost immediately, and his love for Seedy continued to grow. However, in June of 78, only three months into the relationship, Seedy and her family left South Africa and moved to the United States. Every day that they were apart, since phone calls were outrageously expensive and Skype hadn't been invented yet, Tom wrote a letter or recorded a message on a tape to send to Seedy. It didn't take long for him to decide that long distance was not for him, 
And so he decided to follow C.D. to the U.S. and began studying at Andrews University in December of 78, where he received his master's in counseling and guidance in May of 1981. Less than two short years after moving to the United States, Tom and C.D. were married in Berrien Springs on August 10, 1980. They have fond memories of college friends, working friends from Apple Valley and Value Mart, and many friends they made while selling original oil paintings to help pay for college. Three years later, in July of 1983, despite promising each other they would only move south so they could escape the Michigan winters, they moved north instead to Cedar Lake Academy, where Tom began his career as a guidance counselor. By 1985, both Tom and C.D. were teachers at the academy. Tom was involved with student association, driving and emceeing for arrows, sponsoring the school newspaper, recruiting, National Honor Society, among many other things at the school. Students would always remember Tom preparing for national testing, saying, sophomores, please make sure you completely darken your circles. <laughs> Tom was blessed with three wonderful sons, Darren Keegan, Gavin Fletcher, and Trevor Blaine. Tom made sure that growing up, there were lots of trips and adventures and memories that the whole family would be able to enjoy together, which we all will cherish forever. Part of what made these trips we would go on so special was that he was always an active participant in whatever we were doing, whether it was at the water park with Grandma or Cedar Point with Aunt Loretta and Uncle Leon. He would go on all the rides with the kids and was just excited as they were when there was no line. When Papa took the family on the sailboat, he would let his kids drive on occasion. And during ski trips, you would find him out on the slopes with everybody else. And he's got a better injury story than any of us do. <laughs> Probably the most exciting trip for my dad was when we was able to take us boys to South Africa for the first time in 2011, where he enjoyed showing us where he grew up, introducing us to family that we had, most of them we'd never even met before. My dad was happy to welcome two daughters into his family, family, Cassie and Lauren. He loved them deeply and enjoyed his special times with both of them. He was also excited to welcome Carly into the family and looked forward to getting to know her better. He loved all three of these girls in a special way because they each loved his special sons. Family has always been so important to dad. As we kids grew older and left the nest, he would often reach out to us with a simple text message just saying that he was thinking about us. And we could guarantee you that Skype calls would always be at least 10 minutes longer than the first goodbye because there's always more to say. And whenever we came to visit, he would always say, I'm so glad you're home, at least twice, and would always pray with us when we left. Dad and Mom were so grateful for the long road trip they took out to Oregon in 2016 for Lauren and my wedding. They made such fond memories and saw so many friends while on the road. The family also enjoyed another trip to South Africa during the summer of 2017, this time able to take Cassie and Lauren along. He said so many times during the trip how happy he was to be sharing these memories with his family, and that the only thing that could have made it better was if Trevor and Carly could have been there too. Tom had a passion for Adventist education and believed in it with his whole heart. He was a godly gentleman who always tried to show love, compassion, and acceptance to everyone he met. His students were so important to him, over 5,000 in total from 1983 through 2018. He was known as the calm behind the storm, that is my mother, <laughs> and was often heard saying, saying CD, not everyone thinks like you do. <laughs> Many former students and workers have become extended family, and, even, and he even stuck around long enough to have taught and seen children of former students graduate. An alumni weekend was always a favorite of his, as it was a chance to catch up with many former students who he hadn't seen in a long while. He always enjoyed meeting former students' families and would especially seek out any babies that might come into the house. He enjoyed running the Heslop Hotel and welcomed every person who walked through the door with the same squinty-eyed smile we all know and love. We know that more than anything in this world, he would want his Heslop family, his Cedar Lake family, and Great Lakes family to be in heaven. Mr. Heslop, Mr. H, Papa, Papa Heslop, Moocher Dad, Grandpa, Gramps, Pops, Uncle Tommy, Cuz, Old Geezer, Son, Dad, and Babe, we look forward to seeing you in heaven. Amen. 
If you have a program in front of you, we're jumping around a little bit. And I have the, the uh, fun part. We get to do some reflect, reflecting on Tom's life. And if you haven't looked around, if you're near the front, if you haven't looked around, there's standing room only right now. And if each of us took even five seconds, if each of us took even five seconds, Mrs. H, I don't know how long that'd take, but it'd take a long time. I'm gonna set a timer, and, be, and f you understand why. We have so much that we can say about this wonderful man. And I'm gonna set the timer for 17 minutes. I was told, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. I'm just going somewhere between 17 minutes. And I'm just gonna ask that you make your comments short. Share a memory, um, not, a, uh, <laughs> not a thesis. Um, we have a lot to say about him, but a lot of people wanna say something. And because I have the mic, I'm just gonna start and give you an example as a good teacher. I remember Tom before I came to work here at the academy. We'd go over to uh, the Heslop house and spend some alumni time there. Sometimes we wouldn't even make it to the academy because we'd just spend time at the Heslop house. At the time, Mr. and Mrs. Heslop were trying to convince me that Great Lakes Adventist Academy was a wonderful place. And I was trying to convince them otherwise. They won that argument. But I got to meet Tom as the jolly, laughing Tom that some students didn't get to really see for some time. But I'm so happy that I had the, the opportunity, the privilege of getting to know that Tom first before the take your hat off, you're in the ad building Tom. <laughs> Mr. Heslop was always very proper, very professional, high integrity. He loved his students, he loved GLA. He loved his family most, and his God even more. Now we'll open up the time. If you would just stand, and we have some roving mics, and we'll just share a few memories. Yes, please, CD would like for you to share your name, and then share, please. My name is Troy Reichert, and I grew up here in Cedar Lake, and so I got to see Mr. Heslop a lot. Um, I thought I'd start off with something a little lighthearted. Um, Mr. Heslop was, uh, uh, he walked in uh, to one of the offices there one time when I was at Great Lakes Academy, and uh, I got put on social by Mr. Heslop. <laughs> and I remember um, he came to my mom's office afterward, and he was, he was quite cross because I was a Cedar Lake boy, and I, I knew better than that. <laughs> but um, again, like you said, Delwyn, he was just always smiling and uh, just, just loved everyone a whole lot. And I remember, just as another side note, um, when we go over to the, uh, to the Edmore Golf Course, I saw his name up on the thing because he had a bunch of holes in one there. And so he was a very good golfer too, but we're gonna miss him a whole lot. Tom was a man that was very committed to what he was doing. This, this is Bruce Reichert speaking, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I had the privilege of being a colleague of his for 31 years, and I was always amazed at how committed he was to being responsible. To give you an example, he's driven on several of my government trips to Washington, D.C., and he teaches uh, writing. He teaches, uh, taught uh, a senior writing class, and he would make the kids write lots of essays. And those of you that have been teachers know that creating essays isn't necessarily the most jolly thing to do, but he would sometimes park the car, the bus rather, at uh, Union Station. He says, you guys go ahead, I, I got a stack of essays, I want to get these done. And that was the kind of man committed to detail that he was. And um, 
it just, he was just always very dependable and just a great guy, and we're going to miss him a lot. Dawn Nelson, and I'm speaking on behalf of my daughter, Maya Nelson, who went to GLAW and graduated two years ago. And Mr. Heslop was um, very meaningful to us because he was her guidance counselor, and she had significant health problems. And because of that, and because of his work, we were able to get out of here in four years. And she's not able to be here today, and she's heartbroken by that. But Mrs. Heslop, she wants you to know that she's here with you in spirit, and we really um, appreciate all that you all did for us during our four years here. My name is Judy Matusik, and um, Fred and I had the privilege of moving next door to Tom and Seedy when we first came to Great Lakes, <clears throat> and that was the beginning of a long friendship. Um, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite memories of Tom, and I know Seedy knows which one I'm going to tell, <laughs> because every time we're together, we mention this. But we not only did um, Tom and Seedy share Errol's tours with us, we also went on DC trips and on um, trips to Boston every year. And we also took personal vacations, one, once out west and once out east. And on the eastern vacation, um, Fred and I had a lake house. And so for Fred's birthday, Tom bought him a big um, fish trap. And we had it in the back of the car, and, um, along with all of our luggage. And on this tour, um, this trip, every morning, one of the guys would be driving. Either C.D. or I would read a, a devotional, and the other one would pray. And um, we had everything packed in the back of the, bus, or the van, which was amazing. Actually, we stopped at a garage sale, antique sale, something, and I wanted this chair really bad, and, but we weren't sure we could fit it in. So we had to ask the lady, can we please see if this will fit in the car? And we did, and it did, so we did. We got it. The next morning, we um, packed up the car, and we were traveling again. And so Fred, Tom was driving. Um, Fred was riding shotgun. CD was in the back. I, just, I had just given the worship talk, and CD was praying. And suddenly, in the middle of the prayer, we hear, where's the trap? Tom had looked back in his mirror, and the trap had always been in his vision, and it wasn't there. So we knew he wasn't really listening to that prayer that morning. <laughs> So um, anyway, we have never been together more than five minutes. Uh, spring break, when Tom and Seedy came to visit us, um, we shared that story again. And I, I must have shared it a million times. And if I had more time, um, Delwyn. Judy, we only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll save the story. But um, after we moved to Three Rivers, Tom and Seedy came down for a camping trip. and. Um, it was a weekend where there was rain, there was snow, there was sleet, there was sunshine. It was typical Michigan. And um, I came into the, the camper in the middle of the day, and Tom is laying on the bed, and he had this plastic orange tablecloth over him and a two cat on his head <laughs> trying to take a nap. And uh, I just wish I had a picture of that. But Anyway, I, I could take all day and not tell you how special they both are to us. Um, my name is Re Rebecca Smith, and my family met the Heslops when Judy and Fred Matuzic came down to um, the Kalamazoo area. And they have three boys. We had three girls, my two sisters older. And it was a going joke that those Heslop boys were going to marry us home and girls. That never happened. Um, and um, But I was very privileged to not just know the Heslops, but... Um, to be Tom's, Mr. Heslop's, um, I don't know, little secretary, I don't know what we're called, <laughs> but at school, and I gotta tell you, I think he uh, treated me very well because I don't think I worked very hard, <laughs> um, but one day, even though he didn't tell me to do it much, um, he told me to do a lot of stuffing of envelopes, <laughs> and I told him, I don't know if I want to do that, Mr. Heslop, and he said, well, it's everybody's ACT score, so are you sure you don't want to do it? <laughs> well, um, I ended up doing it. So Mr. Heslop, um, he was a very kind man to me and my family, and my family will cherish his memory. Hi, 
Hi, how you doing? I'm uh, Tyler Woods. I was a student of uh, Mr. Heslop's uh, for my junior and part of my senior year. And uh, anybody who's been in one of Mr. Heslop's classes knows that one of the rules that he uh, states very clearly is that you can have humor in your papers, but it has to be clever humor. And uh, for anybody who knows me, my humor is not always clever humor. It's usually pretty dumb humor. Um, so I made it a point before I was done at GLA to write a paper that Mr. Heslop thought was very uh, cleverly written when it came to humor. And the very last paper that I wrote uh, before I was done at GLA, I handed in, fingers crossed, I had not heard the clever humor yet. But once I handed that in and he read it and handed it back to me, he said those words that it, the humor was very clever in that paper. And um, that was just the way Mr. Hessop was. He was very uh, particular about that, but that's what made him who he was, and that's the, the Mr. Hessop that we love. My name is Gary Kruger, and um, I'm one of just a handful of South Africans here um, who were with him at Helderberg College. Um, Tom was my roommate. Probably the best roommate you could ever ask to have. A good man, loved his tea, and, uh, <laughs> and you knew which side of the room was his because his was the tidy side. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a good time together, and uh, I can just remember the agony when his mother died. And, uh, but we're going to miss him, and um, our hearts go out to the family. I had the privilege of being very, very close friends. Uh, Diane uh, Nitzelfeld is the name I'm going to give, because that's what it was when we were in school. And I knew CD when she was a seatman. And it was almost, should I say, 40 years ago. We were young ones. And the Tom and the CD, I remember, were just so much fun. We worked together every day. We ate lunch almost every day, spent Sabbath together hiking. And when I was looking at the slideshow, several pictures were in our apartment eating dinner and hiking on the farm. And um, I have a funny story about tea, because Tom and CD really liked their tea. <clears throat> and one time I had them over for lunch, and I made iced tea. And I had these glasses out, and I put the, and the South Africans here will appreciate this, put the tea in the glasses, and they looked at me like I had just insulted the Queen of England and killed someone. And, I, and, I, and they go, what is that? And I said, it's iced tea. Are you kidding? What are you doing? And I said, people drink iced tea here. And we, it was really funny, and they did not want any. So I think you guys, I think you guys had hot tea. And I drank the iced tea, and I finally quit doing it, because every time I took a sip, I could just see them just cringe and almost gag, like they couldn't believe I was drinking iced tea. So anyway, we have just, uh, just fond, fond memories. They were family, and our family. And I knew the very, very fun Tom Heslop. Thank you. We have a little over four minutes. Hi, I'm Simone Arrington, um, Jubair when I was here. I'm speaking for myself and Teresa Yaroshevich is in New Zealand. She really, really wanted to be here. If she could have taken a, overnight, she would have been here. She sends her love to the family. We were both his readers in the late 1980s, giving my age. Um, he was just the most, the, the sweetest man with the most integrity. He taught us so much. He poured into us with a very gentle, but very, you know, accurate way. It was um, just a blessing to have had him as our teacher and to, as, to have worked for him. Um, so just on behalf of class of 1988, I know there's a few of us here, I just wanted to come and give our love. Had the opportunity to know Tom, this is Jeremy Hall, had the opportunity to know Tom as a student for two years here, and then I had the privilege of working with him here for 10 years at Great Lakes Adventist Academy. He was 
consistent on both fronts. What I mean by that is, as a student, he was a consummate professional, had integrity, and then when I got to know him as a colleague, he was the same man through and through. You can tell the character of a person in how they treat children. And Tom Heslop loved kids. I, three of my daughters, well, all three of my daughters were born at Elma Hospital, and Tom and CD came to see them every single time one of them was born. And then on Wednesday lunch, if you wanted a break with, from your little one so you could eat, you didn't have to ask Tom. He was over grabbing your baby. He loved, loved kids. I work in education. Tom was a master teacher, and he will be greatly missed, not just because of the wonderful teacher he was, but more so because of the man. Amen. It's Naomi Linder. I just remember last year, I was in English too, and you know, yeah, that's, it was really fun actually. And there were like certain kids who would sleep every single class period. And I just remember one time he got like fed up with it and he like didn't say anything. He just walked over to the whiteboard or to the chalkboard, but there was a whiteboard marker or something like that. And he picked it up and he just like, flung it at the kid as he was asleep and I just I think that really accurately represents him and it was just really funny like he can he can address situations in such a good manner and like I'll always remember him saying like that our participation points are flying away because that would happen every class so yeah my name is Deli. I didn't know that my name is Deli Lelangeni known as Coco at the Heslop family I really want to say just a few words about Tom as my little brother. He was a very kind young man for me. And I remember we got no closer when our granddaughter uh, came to Gla. So I was working far away at that time. And whenever we're not at home, uh, our granddaughter would be with the Heslam. So to put everything in short, whenever I was in Kala, I knew that I had a home at the Haslabs. The major thing I want to pinpoint how loving the family is, I was not allowed to take any little suitcase from my car. I would see the boys coming up and take the key, and they would call me Gogo and take my luggage and put it in the house. This family, brother Haslab, was a great man of God who raised his kids appropriately. Boys, you had a great father. Mm -hmm. I'm Jordan Reichert. I grew up in this community. Uh, Mr. Heslop was one of many kind of like uncles, other dads in my life. Um, Chaplain Hall, you commented that you can tell a character by, of a person by how they treat children. Um, I was one of those children who grew up with Mr. Heslop jumping on the trampoline with us and throwing footballs around with us. Um, I tell my students all the time, I'm a teacher now, that you can really tell something about a person when kids like to be around them. And what does that say about Jesus, you know? Because kids like to be around him. And when I think of the joy of Jesus and being with children, I really can't differentiate between what that might look like and what Mr. Heslop playing with kids looked like. Um, and also, you can tell a character by, of a person by how they are with animals. And if you know anything about Mr. Heslop, little kids and little dogs. <laughs> Game on. Game on. He's a wonderful person, and we all love him. We're going to hear two more from Denver and from Skip, and then we're, our time will be over. Hi, my name is Denver Nelson, and so one of my favorite memories of them is they had this little daegu rat thing <laughs> that I hated with a passion, and it would get out of the cage, and it was this filthy little creature, and <laughs> it, one time we came back, I don't know where we were going, I think it was at Camini one time, and it got out of the cage, and I immediately was like, oh my goodness, where is this thing? And he just was like, okay, let's go for it. And he started crawling on the ground, looking all over, and it shot out from under the couch, 
and started running all over the house, and Mrs. H and Mr. H were both jumping all over the couch looking for this creature, while I was on the chair, freaking out, not wanting anything to do with this thing. Another thing we did when, when I was young was they had these stuffed animals, these animal stuffed animals, that every time we'd go over, I don't think I was at the house for five minutes before this huge man of stuffed animals came out. And what we'd do is we'd put them on the fan, and my sister and I, and Mr. H, would sit there and try to put bets on which one would fall, fling off first. And we would turn that fan on high, and they would just start flying all over the place, and <laughs> pictures would get hit, and lamps, and Mrs. H just was just smiling away, not saying anything, which I'm pretty sure, knowing her, probably killed her to see all the stuff was flying <laughs> over. But she just sat there, and so, you know, I called him Grandpa Aslop. And so for me, it's a rough thing, but Grandma CD, I love you. I know it's hard for all of us. My name is Skip Han, and I can probably speak for all of our staff and the people that live here in Cedar Lake and have had the honor of being Tom's friend. As Jeremy said, he was a master teacher but he was also a master friend. Many, many, many years of golfing and hanging out and doing family stuff together, the man never was out of character, ever. I tried once or twice to get him to bend the rules, but it would not happen. The one fa unfailing thing that Tom was always happy to talk about was his family and how he loved his wife and his family, his boys. But one quick little bit of levity, this year Tom drove on the senior trip and on Monday morning, April 1, April 1st, I said, Tom, do you know what day it is? He goes, yes, it's April 1. I said, are you up for something? He says, well, what is it? <laughs> and I said, if I lied just a little bit and told the kids that the bus wouldn't work, could you join in with having me help these kids push this bus to get it started? <laughs> We had some seniors behind that automatic bus trying their best to push it. <laughs> Tom Heslop will always be remembered like a brother. Thank you for those memories, and I'm sure you'll cherish them as much as we'll cherish the memory or being with Tom.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. shine but God who called 
me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you Thank you, Mike and Jackie and Lisa. That was beautiful. Um, CD and family, I hope you don't mind. I asked them to move the pictures back so I can see. But we're going to put them right back. Tom Heslop was a personal friend of mine. Him and his family meant a lot to ours, my wife, Jenny, and our two boys. And even after we left Cedar Lake, we would come back and visit whenever the Heslop Hotel had no vacancy, <laughs> which wasn't very often. And Tom had a way with our dog. We had a dachshund, Shiloh. He called Shiloh the sausage dog. And Tom just had a magical way that every time he spoke, the sausage dog would wet the spot that he was standing in. <laughs> so when I see these pictures of Tom with dogs, we had, that, we had that experience. I'm very honored to be here in such an important occasion because I know in spite of the fact that we could say, why did this happen? that Jesus Christ is still in control, knows what he's doing, and wants to be here with us now. In fact, here's what David said in Psalms 119, verse 50. He said, this is my comfort in my affliction. That word affliction in trial, tribulation, depression, anxiety, fear. This is my comfort. Thy word revives me. And the word revive in the Hebrew means come back to life. And so I want to use this wonderful, most powerful book that, that exists in the world to prove that point. This is our comfort in our affliction. Thy word brings us back to life. Let us pray. Father, to this point, this service has been filled with the Holy Spirit's presence, and I want it to continue that you would use this humble person, me, to speak your words so that we can see that you are there and you do care and you do know what you're doing. So use me in spite of me to be a blessing and thank you. You always answer any prayer that's offered to you in sincerity because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so for this special occasion, I chose the story that may be very common to you, found in Luke, the seventh chapter. It starts with verse 11. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, you have a Bible. It's Luke 7, verse 11. And notice what it says here. Now it happened the day after that he, Jesus, went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. 
and the large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then Jesus came near and he touched the open coffin. And those who carried it stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he, Jesus, presented him to his mother. Now, let's look closely at this story and the elements in it and see how this does bring us back to life, how this does give us encouragement. First of all, we look at the name of the city Jesus showed up to at that very moment is called Nain. And even archaeologists aren't quite sure where it is, but for one thing, it was a non, had no strategic importance whatsoever. It was a poor city in the mountain village north of Capernaum. And so allow me to call it no place. And I want you to notice that the dead man being brought out, we're not giving his name. And so allow me to call him no name. And then the story tells us that his mother was there and she was a widow. Now, let me explain something about a widow back in those days. A widow was a woman who didn't have a husband. And if she didn't have a husband, then she needed a son to advocate for her. As wrong as it was and against Bible principles, which Jesus came to show, they did not treat women well back then probably like we don't today. And so therefore, the fact that she was going out following her only son who was dead meant she had no hope. So let me call her nobody. So I asked the question when I read this story one day in a time very similar to this, what in the world was Jesus doing at that very moment in no place with no name for nobody? And then I realized that it said it in the, in the verse number 14. Then he came, he touched the open coffin, or no, excuse me, the one before that. When the Lord saw her, he what? He had compassion. Compassion. That word in the Greek means care. But the Greek word here is an emphatic form of that word, meaning from the very depths of his bowels. From deep inside, Jesus looked at the situation and he cared and he intervened and he did something special. Is there anybody here who feels like you're nobody? Maybe not many people know your name. Maybe you live in an obscure place. I want you to know it doesn't matter. You know, there's a reason this man did not have a name. Because Jesus wanted us to know it's all of us. And, and I marvel that he took this large crowd way out in the mountainous areas north of the the Sea of Galilee, in the place called Galilee, and appeared at the gate of the city at precisely the moment they were coming out. None of this is a mistake. None of this is a coincidence. 
This is proof from this beautiful book that God does care, even though we may not have answers why. And then I try to think what it'd be like to hang on the cross of Calvary. Others have done that. But we Seventh-day Adventists are very privileged to have the spirit of prophecy, which tells us on the cross of Calvary, he believed he would never see the Father again. That's called the second death in the book of Revelation. That means that if he paid the price for my sins, he would be excluded from heaven. And Satan was there saying, Jesus, you fool, get off this cross. These people don't deserve it. And yet Jesus didn't come off the cross. And if he had, I would not be here. And neither would you. He understands and now he's here by our side to help us with our grief and our pain and even our doubts so that we trust him and not the world. Because Satan uses things like this to cause us to doubt. But the Bible is very plain. He calls Lazarus out of the grave, folks. When he did that, he ensured that he would be crucified. And he knew it when he did it. And so I want you to be comforted. You know, Psalms 116 verse 15 says something that I keep with me all the time. Precious in the sight of of the Lord is the death of his people. And so Jesus is watching us very, very closely. He has compassion upon us. And he wants us to hang in there and keep believing. And soon we will have complete understanding. And so... This is my comfort in my affliction. Thy word brings me back to life. Father, I want you to bless this congregation in a very special way because Tom was a special individual and it was so tragic and sudden and unexpected and there are young people here, Lord, and they're weighing the balances of Christianity in their minds and in their hearts. And they're wondering about you and your character. Oh, Lord, assure them. Assure them that you know what you're doing. And later on, we'll all discover the reason that this happened. Now comfort the family in a very special way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
The Heslop family would like to thank this village of friends and family and for all of your support. Over the past little bit, your phone calls, your text messages, emails, Facebook messages, meals, money, hugs, and countless prayers, which have been lifted up on our behalf. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for spending this evening with us as we celebrate the journey of joy that my father had in his life. And thank you for reaching and touching our family. Before the benediction, the family uh, would like to see 
those who haven't gotten a chance to give their condolences, that as the ushers are leading people out to come through the center aisle, um, because they would love to greet each and every one of you. So feel free afterwards, as after the prelude, that we will come to the center aisle and greet the family. And also you see in the bulletin that if you still want to do a, more of a visit, that the commons will be open for everyone to gather together and spend some more time. So at this time, why don't we bar our heads together? Father, you are so gracious to us. You are so loving to us. Because, Father, you have given us the ultimate gift in Jesus Christ, who died on Calvary for our sins. Well, Father, it didn't end there because he was resurrected. And Father, because he was resurrected, we have hope of eternal life. We have hope of the resurrection. And Father, we all have come here to gather together to remember Tom and how he touched many lives. Father, you heard the testimonies. And Father, we pray for peace and comfort. And we know we can receive the peace and comfort through your scriptures. Because there are so many promises. And Father, we cling on to the promise of Revelation 21.4. That there will be no more tears. No more death. And no more pain. Father, there will be no more crying for lost loved ones. So, Father, we know deep in Tom's heart, he want everyone here to be gathered at the sea of glass. So I pray, Father, that as Tom lived a life that was in harmony with your will, I pray the same for us. So, Father, I pray for the family. I pray that when there are times where they are alone, that you will come and you will give them comfort and peace. Fill their hearts, fill the void with your presence. And I pray, Lord, that we can, we can look forward for the time where all the dead in Christ shall rise first and that we will be caught up in the clouds with thee. Be with us now, we ask in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen.